two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Chad on Score North and scorenorth.com. You know, it was a great hockey game. The flows were back and forth. And, I mean, the overtimes, obviously, there's some unbelievable looks and great saves. And the hockey game had everything, um, you know. So, yeah, we're happy the way that we held our composure and all that good stuff that everybody talks about in the playoffs. We we did it tonight. We got to do it again. <laughs> Here I do it. He's Here ready. It. He's, He's ready. The He's ready. There we go. <laughs> Pull the trigger. There he is. There it is. Come on, flag. He's Don't. composed. He's gritty. He's fatigued but fighting through it. Judd's Hockey Show doesn't sleep. It waits for game two. And drinks a lot of coffee. <laughs> and whiskey gingers. Whiskey uh, gingers. If you missed the uh, the double overtime recap edition of Judd's Hockey Show from 2 o'clock in the morning, you can find that on the Score North YouTube channel and also on the Judd's Hockey Show and Mackie and Judd podcast feed. This is Minnesota Sports with Mackie and Judd, your, your daily dose of Minnesota sports entertainment, speculation, and therapy and wow, so many things to get to. Wow, what a what a difference in how the Wolves entered the playoffs and how the Wild entered the playoffs, right? The Wolves entered all excited and just like tripped on the front doorstep and fell on their face. And the Wild, you know, they sent out that hype video that featured, by the way, Judd's Hockey Show and Jesse Pierce yeah. with some of the commentary. We appreciate it. And the punch on the end of it was was grit first from Dean Evison. Is there a more like I don't know? It, it's kind of hard and nebulous to define grit in hockey, but when you know it, you see it. That's kind of how I feel about grit. Yeah. Last night was the epitome of wild grit. Double overtime. You're playing mostly defensive on your heels for the third period. Seventeen shots saved in the first overtime period. Matt Dumba sparking everything in the second part of that game with the hit on Pavelski, which we can get to because. Uh, Dallas Stars fans and media members are pissed about that hit. Mm -hmm. Uh, But just, I thought, I was kind of, at first I was like, grit first, really? Like, that's the slogan. But last night, I mean, I don't know how you would better define grit first than that victory in double overtime last night. And who has been talking about this for months now, that this team has to play exactly like this? Because you know what grit is? Here's the real slogan. We're not skilled enough to not play like that. (laughs) Great. That's the real slogan. So, so like, because grit is to, it's a little long for us. Yeah, but, but, but right, but Phil, for merchandising, your, you know. But Phil, to your point, um, grit is sort of just sort of the cliche fallback word. Like, I get it; it makes sense, but it's sort of the cliche fallback word. But if you were to really get up in front of that team, what, like, what did that team hear? That team did, didn't hear grit first. What it really heard was, you guys aren't skilled and talented enough to play any other way than what I demand. And that is that you fight every battle, you hit guys constantly. This was, I I told Dex this, last night's game was what the Blues used to do to the Wild. Yes. Where you'd be like, why does the Wild, and, and like Dallas has a ton of skill, and the Wild has had skill. But you know what, in the playoffs especially, and this is partially true in basketball too, Skill can be de-emphasized to a certain degree by the by the ability to be physical, to play a hard game, to play a game that doesn't come off as passive. And that's, in sports, that's what sets you up for a goal like Hartman scored. Yeah. It, 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 it does kind of feel like the Blues, the Blues series is a great example. And even though like those, Black, those Blackhawks series from eight, ten years ago, the Blackhawks are one of the more skilled teams in the league. Yes. Even those series, it often felt like the Wild were the ones getting punked or like the little brother that was getting the, you know, like the whitewash snow, like the snow in their face kind of a thing. And I don't know, that 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 Dumba hit on Pavelski, that's a 38-year-old centerpiece veteran star player going back to his days with the Sharks. I mean, to sort of punk him like that in Dallas, hostile environment that you made 10 times more hostile – and to yeah. stand up, it kind of reminded me of my favorite movie, Rocky IV. You're in Russia. It's Christmas. It's the hostile Russian crowd. And Rocky's the little brother, the little, you know, he's about a foot smaller than Drago. And there's a point in, like, the end of the first round, second round, where he punches Drago right. Like, Drago's never been punched like that, you know? 
And not that the stars are Drago. Maybe the Avalanche would be Drago if you keep advancing. Or close, like the yeah. Bruins in the Stanley Cup Finals would be Drago yeah. if you got there. But it was I think it was it was pretty jarring, and we'll get to some of the reaction from the Dallas side, but I think it was jarring for the crowd. It was jarring for clearly for Pravelski. It was jarring for the stars. It was it, it was just the wild standing up and saying figuratively and literally, we're here, we're gritty, and we're gonna make you feel pain. And it's gonna be un- this series is gonna be uncomfortable for you. And it's been probably twenty years since you felt that way about a wild team in a playoff series. Two thousand three, right? Mm-hmm. Like 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 last time that you felt and again, this team has a lot of characteristics to that team. But Ryan Hartman, make no mistake, probably shouldn't have been playing and he scored the winning goal. I, he could barely skate. Like his right leg, there's something wrong. And I thought there was a chance that he might not, uh, because he got hurt in the first OT, that he might not come out for the second. He not only came out, but he scored the winning goal. And there was one point where he was, before that, had a scoring chance, drove to the net, and you could sort of see he was pushing off with his right leg. Like he couldn't put weight on it, and, and he still scored. So, I mean, all of those things are the variables that at least allow you a semblance of hope that this team understands unequivocally who it is. And Dumba's hit barely after that because it was was looking like he might get a misconduct. He was going to get obviously being reviewed for a five. And and then after that, he was probably one of the most noticeable players in the ice. And, I mean, he was being booed, heavily booed every time he was touching the puck. There was a moment in overtime he almost sinks the game winner. I mean, that place would have went ballistic if Matt Dumba ends up being the overtime hero for the Wild. And, yeah, that's the style they have to play. Like, you know, last year they were one of the best five-on-five teams. They had scoring up and down their lineup. They could score with anyone. But sometimes that lethal type of offense, five-on-five in the regular season, doesn't translate to postseason success and how the Wild are playing, although I would prefer not to do almost two full overtime periods in the two in the morning. Uh, that style of play where they're going basically two hours without a goal being scored is how they're going to win a lot of those playoffs. But, but doesn't doesn't Dallas come out of that? I mean, it's it's fatiguing and exhausting for both teams, and now you have to turn on turn around and play less than forty eight hours later in game two. But Dallas winds up like Pavelski is not going to play tomorrow night, so Dallas is fatigued without an excellent player and down one nothing and down a home game in the seven game series. Well, and here's the best part starting with the Dumba hit is Dallas is down. Dallas is tired now. And Dallas just got a tutorial in the fact that they are going to not through fighting, but through the physicality, get their ass kicked the entire series. There is nothing in sports, in my opinion, like taking away a team's will to play because you can make a team. And, and now the stars might bounce back and win, but they have to realize that if the wild continues to play like they did in game one, it's going to come at a price. Marcus Foligno did not get on the score sheet, but I would say, I would dare to say there wasn't a check he didn't complete. And he was hitting guys and knocking guys down. Like, it's one thing, if that had just been a highly skilled game, and they'd gone back and forth, and Dallas lost. Dallas would say, okay, too bad, great fun, Mm -hmm. we'll come back and get him. But when you now have to go, and I, I mean, again, this goes back to 03, maybe the last time we saw this. When you have to go into your locker room and you've got ice bags on, and you are, and you're hurt, and your star players are like, "What the hell?" Football. And then you got to do that again. It is, it is for for football fans. It's the equivalent of what the 49ers did to the Vikings in 2019 yeah. in the second round. Well, you you bring up Felino. My memory's a little foggy, and old Mac, old Macadac, man, still getting you two months into his uh, return to the Central Time <laughs> Zone. Still not really acclimated to yeah. Central Time Zone, and and late night central time zone viewing so he fell asleep in the first overtime woke up in the middle of the night and it's like three in the morning and i'm like watching back <laughs> and it was probably right after you guys got done with uh judd's hockey show but the there was a second big hit so the pavelski hit was obviously the tone setter and everything but i i think it was there was a dallas player that was trying to skate back to the bench kind of at the end of a of a line shift and uh i think it was felina that came across Totally clean, like, it was. but it was almost like Dallas came in just doop the doo. You know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna kind of skate around and pick on the wild, right? Like everyone does in the playoffs. I mean, it is legal to deliver hits in hockey, so I just want to make that clear to Dallas. And and here, let's probably a good time to get to the, to the pissed off reaction from 
fans, and this is from The Athletic, all right? And this is, I'm guessing if this happened flip-flopped, I don't think the Athletic Dallas beat writer would have the same vitriol, you know, if Matt Dumba was the one laid out, or I guess the comp would be Kaprizov or somebody sure. laid out in that situation, right? Yep. So I'm going to read this, and you guys tell me, let's be as objective as we can be here. Right? Let's not be a bunch of, uh, which we're not, I don't think, a bunch of homers. You tell me if no. this point of view from the Dallas... <laughs> Ne we would never. We would never do that. There we go. Game one. <laughs> never. No. Objective. Cronkite. Rather. Is there, <laughs> is there merit to this side of the coin here? Here's what the write-up says. If that hit is legal, it's embarrassing. And I'm going to stop there for a second. It's not legal. He got penalized. He just didn't get a five-minute major. And technically, got, there was no call on the ice initially. Like they huddled, then decided it was a five, then they had to review, then they decided it was two minutes. Okay, but it was, but like at the end of the day, he didn't yeah. like he he got penalized for the hit. Correct. So to so to say that, well, if that hit is legal, it's embarrassing. The hit's not legal. The hit's not legal. Well, it's it's a gray area, which we'll get to. But sure. many defending the hit while expressing sympathy for uh, for Pavelski's head injury say the hit was shoulder to shoulder. And the blow to the head came after when Pavelski's head clearly makes direct contact with the ice. Dumba is a player known for playing on the edge. And then he lists like three other questionable hits from the past. I'm not here to issue verdicts on Dumba or try to figure out his intent. I don't think he was trying to knock Pavelski out of the game. At least I sure hope he wasn't. But what's indisputable is that Dumba's hit was late. It was vicious. And it was completely unnecessary what are your thoughts it's a okay so and this is the thing about replay when you slow it down you slow it down a lot and now you're watching it for the 18th time in slow motion it was late but this is the same exact issue that football has with the quote-unquote defenseless receiver who puts his helmet down and changes where his head is at and takes a huge hit and we replay it 18 times and say, oh, my God, that defensive back was trying to decapitate him. When, in fact, it is a bang-bang play. Um, if Matt Dumba had jumped and had taken his shoulder or el elbow or had taken his elbow and chicken wing Pavelski in the head, you got a problem. That's five. But go back and watch that at real time. And you'll see Pavelski gets rid of the puck and bang gets hit okay now if i slow it down it looks bad because the puck's going like this in slow-mo so but, the athletic the athletic writer by the way posted frame by frame showing yeah, exactly here, well, that, here here's where the puck is he's kind of i don't know if it was on net or it was he was cycling it like just behind the net and he fr he f sort of froze the frame at dumba hasn't even started his check and the puck is off the stick of pavelski yeah but frame by frame is not how Life, life is played. Life so. does not work frame by frame. That that would be convenient. But the the important thing here is, and this goes back, Phil, to what what you said. The hit Felino delivered, which was not a knockout hit, but that hit was on Jason Robertson, who is Dallas's star player. And the reality is this: it's game one. You're on the road. You are looking to set a tone. The Wild completed just about every check last night. They didn't do it for fun. They did it to set a tone that this is a different team. And so it's unfortunate Pavelski got hurt. He wasn't. He clearly wasn't expecting. He dumped the puck and didn't think he was going to get hit, so he ignored D Dumba, mistake one. That, that's a you problem. You can't ignore a guy. Um, and, and he fell awkwardly. And what happens is his stick hits him, and then his head hits the, the ice. Thank God, of course, he's got a helmet on. But all of that being said... Um, one is if the, if this was Kaprizov, it's partially on Kaprizov. If the, if the skates on his foot for not paying attention, but this is how you establish a series. Like, like we have, it would be hypocritical now to, to be like, well, that's a borderline. That's a dirty hit. When we have bitched and complained rightfully so about the fact that the wild's gone into several playoff series and been the one that, that has been the 98 pound weakling getting the sand kicked in their face. Like, this is what this series is going to be. And we're going to see a Dallas player at some point in time take a run at a wild player. I guarantee it. 
Now, the key there is, if it's legal, I don't want to hear this fan base now sanctimoniously say, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. That's the, That could be... Now, I think you got a case to make. Dallas ain't going to want to play this game. And this is where, Phil, Ryan Reeves, who, who doesn't fight much now and actually doesn't even take penalties, becomes incredibly important. Because you know what happens when somebody looks crossways at Kaprizov? Ryan Reeves comes on the ice, and everyone says, holy cow, we ain't doing that. There was a couple little moments, it felt like, where he was just big big brother kind of roaming around. That's what he is. He, but, he knew but, that he was, uh, after that hit, he was he knew he was on patrol, right? And Jamie Benn of Dallas, as, as Brian Boucher, who was the analyst on the ESPN2 telecast said last night, Jamie Benn used to be, you know, pre-Reeves. He would have been like the big bad guy to come to uh, Pavelski's rescue, and we probably we probably would have had a shift in the physicality there. But when you got a guy like Reeves, ain't nobody gonna fight that fight. So that's what <laughs> that's the tone. And like, I, I hate to just be so black and white about this. Like, welcome to playoff hockey, buddy. This is how hits happen. This is this is gonna happen. You're, you're gonna see a physicality type type of game like this where hits are gonna happen. You know, we always talk about, you know, should you even be dropping the gloves and is this fight even useful? And there's times like that where I can say, okay, it, it, are we going to extend this game for 15 more minutes? We're going to keep dropping the gloves just to prove a point. I can get behind some of that where that does get a little ridiculous. This is the playoffs, man. People are going to be coming after you. People are going to be hitting you hard. Welcome to playoff hockey. Is this the yeah. first rodeo for you? Come on. Are you calling now uh, when you say guy, are you, uh, are you calling out random athletic beat writer guy? Or are you, are you talking to Pavel to Pavelski I'm guy? Not or, Pavel or I'm both? not talking Pavelski, Pavelski guy. I'm talking knows. about I'm talking about the writer. Or I'm does he know? The writer. Maybe like, he know he knows now. Yeah. Knows dude, now. Dude, this is playoff <laughs> hockey. Welcome to it. Come on. Yeah. This is this is what happens. And you know what? Don't steal our franchise. Don't steal our franchise. Yeah, right? also, we haven't this is forgotten. Payback. Yeah, thirty year anniversary. Steal yep. our franchise, find out. Bleep around, find out. Yep. <laughs> guy. <laughs> State of hockey, baby. <laughs> State of kicking ass. There's uh there's several other things to get to here, um, and we and we will in a second. But a shout out to our friends at EcoFun, a new partner of ours here on Score North, and uh, you know I'm very excited. So I'm a big uh, big scooter guy now. Over the past six or seven months, not as much in the winter because you know, but uh, EcoFun has all sorts of high powered, amazing scooters. Like you can save three hundred dollars off the total price of a new Yamaha Zuma 125 fuel-injected scooter. Lowest price ever. They have blue. They have black. Uh, if you're the stars, you're probably both black and blue today from the physicality from last night. But uh, those Yamaha scooters, $300 off. They also have, uh, let's see here, all colors and sizes of scooters in stock for the spring sale. And um, most of these scooters average 100 to 120 miles per gallon. So, you know, get a we get jet on a scooter at some point. Get out to EcoFun, and we'll put a helmet on you. You know, be safe. Uh, I'll start with that. Be helmet. dangerous or anything. And uh, also a shout-out to our friends over at Dennis Kirk and DennisKirk.com. So uh, if you're into scooters, that's one thing. If you're into motorcycles, all you Ragnars out there, Dennis Kirk is the place for you. You'll find what you need at DennisKirk.com so you can ride more and weight less. Over 180,000 parts and accessories in stock. Clothing and helmets, too. Shipping is free for orders over $89. Order by 8 p.m. They ship the same day. Everything you need for your ride at DennisKirk.com. All right, I have a, a bin of talkers I want to throw out to you guys here. The Judd's Hockey Show crew just going on fumes right now. On absolute fumes. It was game one. Are you kidding? I'm ready to go. Re rest up Let's for game tonight. two. Let's go tonight. Brock, on, playoffs. Brock Faber had maybe... Maybe the play of the game defensively, his sprawling, it was a double overtime, his sprawling, saving defensive play. And uh, so he's kind of going, as you're looking from behind the goalie, if you didn't see the play, his body was sort of moving to the left, and then all of a sudden he dives back to the right to uh, to help save a goal. And I don't know, man, like the guy's played, what, three, four NHL games now <laughs> since signing from the Gophers, and he looks like he belongs to my amateur eyes anyways. He absolutely does, and this this is what I said. He is better than, uh, so he's not better than Spurgeon. Middleton's very good. Brodeen is marvelous. Dumba, I don't know where that came from last night. He played a franchise record 38 minutes and 31 seconds. I, I don't know where, like I can't explain that, that one. But Brock Faber, 
makes a lot of things look effortless and he's playing in his third game. And as I, I got a tweet that I'm going to assume was honest last night that said, this kid has finals in two weeks. Um, what he did last night is he? Just, just, well, if he wants to, you know, he seems like a good kid. He might take them. Why don't you but, do that? Do that in 15 years. If you, well, he can do it online. He can do it virtually. Who cares? Or something, I don't exactly know. right. Who cares? But, the way that he played last night, I expected him to, to be good. I did not expect that. Brock Faber was marvelous. There, there was uh, one play that ESPN2 did an isolation on. I think it was in the second period, if I'm not mistaken, at which Brock Faber is against the against the boards on the right wing side in his own zone, and he's essentially trapped by two Stars players, and he has no one around him. There is no one helping him. And like most guys, including veterans, would have freaked out turned over the puck, done something potentially dumb. Faber looked like, eh, whatever. And he handled it, and he was absolutely... You know what? Gustafson and Faber and Brodeen all have the same thing. They have no heart rate. They're flatlined. They they don't panic. And Dex, to me, that is, playoff-wise, one of the most important things. The last thing I want is is the emotional pendulum to be swinging the entire game. And Faber at what twenty twenty one looks like it doesn't swing. Yeah, we'll probably say this a thousand times, but there's a lot of Brodeen to his game. Um, it's not flashy. It's not going to be offensive great numbers, but he's going to log a ton of minutes. He's going to be defensively responsible. He's going to be doing a lot of things that don't quantify into a box score just from the minute side and just from uh, watching that you're going to be able to see that this guy can contribute. And he also, even though was heavily outshot, he was creating offense uh, yesterday too. So he was driving the play. He wasn't a liability on the ice. I mean, he's going to be in the top four most likely by the start of next season, especially if Matt Dumba, if they move on from him. So he's a viable piece. And that was a great trade for Bill Guerin, man. I mean, they got Faber and a first round pick. And and I know Fiala was uh, was, was injured last year, uh, was injured for game one yesterday. Man, and I crush. love Kevin Fiala. But that was a really good trade from Bill Guerin. On the you, uh, you mentioned Gustafson and uh, just having sort of a flat line ice in his veins pulse. This is the most comfortable I have felt with a wild goaltending situation going into the playoffs. Maybe again in twenty years. The fact that the fact that you can just first of all seventeen saves in the first overtime when players were just gassed, right? Yep. And he comes up with like what was like fifty saves for the game or whatever it was. And you've got Flurry if he stumbles in reserve. This is this has gone from last year. You're wondering, oh my God, should they play Talbot? Do you trust either of these guys? To I have personally full trust in the Gus Bus. And if he happens to stumble, if his pulse does start to <laughs> rise or whatever, okay, we'll just put a future Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all time, in net and see if he can catch fire in the postseason. So he he said that both of the. Uh... The power play goals he gave up to put Dallas up two to one in the second period were bad goals. The Wild, and this this is the one thing about Game One, and I don't know if it can be fixed on faceoffs. Dallas ended up dominating, and the combined total of power play time for those two goals was nine seconds. The first one was off a faceoff, Goudreau lost. Uh, the puck goes into the slot, bang, three seconds in. That's a goal. That was a very difficult play, and I don't blame Gus Bus. The Robertson goal, which was a faceoff loss by Sam Steele, could have been stopped. But what I loved was Gustafson said, yeah, that in my opinion, both bad goals. I reset myself and was fine. I didn't think about it. I didn't, like, harp on it. And, to Phil, to your point, too, you think about this, okay? And, like, the things that have changed here. And it's one game. Sample size is very small. I get that. But how often did we see Dubnik give up that fluky damn playoff goal that could mm -hmm. turn the game? A right? five-on-five five goal, just straight up, like, yes. Just a bad goal. To like, not well, give up a five-on-five five goal in yeah. six period, five periods of hockey yes. is also a tone setter. And, and ultimately, and I don't know how, how much influence Bill Guerin, the GM, had on this, but ultimately, Dean Evason... Did a hell of a job. Started Gus. As Declan kept saying, he and deep in his heart, he wanted to start Flurry. Yep. Um Faber. Faber. Last year, Faber don't play. They they put in 
you know, we play Johnny Merrill and we play the other. Yeah, Goligoski. <laughs> These guys got the experience. Yeah. It's like, really, is that the smart move? If you think about what Dean did last night, um, I think he did a lot of things that that ran counter to how he thinks because that blue series was such a disaster based on what he didn't do. Um, so, yeah, I think this entire, th- I, I think there were so many positive signs and Gustafson being as calm, cool, and and collected. And almost certainly now he will get and deserves the net in game two was huge. Yeah, and look, no goals allowed five on five. I mean, stopped a ton of pucks. Those nine seconds of power play time obviously aren't great. You got to stay out of the box, and that's a disciplined thing. Uh, but he was phenomenal. I mean, his demeanor is so calm, and goalies are weird. Goalies are kind of a bit of oddball characters, and he just has a completely neutral demeanor about him just from afar that you can tell really works for him. It's not your, it's not, not your typical goalie. He's cut from a different cloth. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good dude. The other thing I noticed last night, too, was uh... – our old friend, Mr. Quick Trip himself, Ryan Suter, was a little little salty, a little chippy. Some cross was. checks in front of goalies. Mr. Tough Guy skating around last night in that Stars uniform. What, what did you guys make of that? Go ahead, Dex. Dude, he's, this is exactly why he, he was bought out here. Like he's, I don't think he's, he's well-liked in a lot of circles. Um, he does a lot of this stuff from behind. You know, He does a lot of these things that aren't egregiously dirty hits that you can see right full full frontal, but you watch a replay and you're seeing a cross check from a situation that where a player is defenseless a little bit, he's going to throw it in there. And, you know, sometimes when you have that guy on your team, it can work. You know, Ryan Reeves is an enforcer. Ryan Reeves is going to do things that upset you from an opponent's side, but now he's on your team and you love him. There was wild fans who were ripping Ryan Reeves two years ago when they played the Knights in the playoffs. Now all of a sudden, oh, wait, we love Ryan Reeves, okay? I think with Suter, it's a different animal. I think Suter is a cheap shot artist. I think Suter is not well received and respected by his peers. There's a reason Bill Guerin basically said, I will take a 15% penalty for this guy to not play for me for five to six years because it's not worth him in my room and he's not worth it on the ice. I think he's, I think he's completely disrespected by a lot of players. And I think we're seeing it a lot more in the last few years. He was a pain in the ass. He was the type of guy that felt like he, well, he didn't feel, feel like he was you know friends with uh the o- owner and he was a guy who basically thought he controlled the entire team and crazy did did too um but here's and and the two cross checks on on Kaprizov were ridiculous both of them weren't called and those were just true cheap yeah. shots now they're not surprising he did that here too but let me give you one stat about suits that I absolutely love from last night in game one of what figures to be a fairly long series, this geriatric played 34 42, 34 minutes and 42 seconds. He is a top pair defenseman on this team in Dallas. He should probably be a second pair at the best. Wear him down. Wear him down. This will take a toll. I guarantee it. And his play has dropped off. He, um, when, when Parisi and Suter were bought out, Parisi was declining. And I actually thought that he, he might be cooked. And Suter wasn't declining. He was just, or he hadn't declined as much as Parisi. He was just a royal pain in the ass. And so Bill Guerin got sick of that. Um, now it's flipped. Parisi had a pretty damn good, good year, contributed. I think he's found his, his role. Um, Suter is playing a ton and his play has dropped off. I actually welcome his presence because I think that his presence can be exploited. And if you can get him to play as much as he continues to play, which he has no business doing, I think advantage wild for sure. So that's the good thing, but the cross checks on Kaprizov and the second one in front of the goal concerns me. Um, I felt Kaprizov's play, which for the first three periods was phenomenal. Like the first period, he, he was a one man whirling dervish show. Uh, but if you saw the overtime, I felt Kaprizov's play dropped off and I don't think it dropped off because he, he was tired because he is a physical specimen. Um, he left the, he left the ice after the first or after the second cross check in front. I'm a little bit concerned there. Uh, now he'll continue to play. I get that. But I guess my question is, 
did that do some type of damage that's going to affect him into game two? But where Ryan Suter down? You know, it's incredible. I just was kind of curious how many minutes was he playing in the regular season? And he had, uh, it's it's not a career low in minutes. You got to go back to his age 22 season with Nashville back in 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. The last time he played fewer minutes per game. So his average time on ice this season with Dallas was 20 minutes and 23 seconds. Yeah. You know, overtime, everyone's going to play more minutes because you're playing double overtime. But boy, if you, you know, he's not, he's not used to, you know, 10 years ago with the wild, he was literally averaging 30 minutes in regulation every night for like three years. And he played in almost all the games. He's not used to playing 25 minutes, let alone 30, okay. 34 minutes. And he's now he's 38 years old. Are you guys going to welcome him back with open arms though? In a few years when, that number 20 gets hung from the it's not going to the rafters. rafters. Don't, it's not going to the rafters. I don't know. That, that, that not going. I don't know. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> that Royal. Sponsored by Quick Trip. My family and I love to stop at Quick Trip for some coleslaw and chicken Caesar wraps for dinner. Yeah. When I when, when me and my million-dollar contract are driving <laughs> home in my Corvette, I stop at Quick Trip. That pain in the ass <laughs> would come into the locker room between periods, get his hands on the stat sheet to make sure that he was playing a sufficient amount here. That's how big a pain that, that guy was. So I'm not going to r- rue it if he uh, takes a couple of hits in game two. So, man, what a what a fun way to, to bust into the playoffs. And we're going to stop our conversation here. If you guys haven't heard Judd's hockey show from last night, and you guys will be going live to tomorrow. So tomorrow night, we're going to do something unprecedented. We're going to yeah. have potentially two live post game streams happening at the same time on the score North YouTube channel. Flagrant howls and Judd's hockey show. (laughs) We're not totally sure, but we're going to just sort of flip the switch and see what happens. I guess. Choose your own adventure. Basically. (laughs) Do you want wild or do you want the wolves? Wild. I think the wolfies might be in for a little bounce back. Do you want the professional team? Or the team that has talent but is not professional. Well, it's got Mike Conley. Well, we will we will talk about them on a second chunk of Mackie and Judd here. Minnesota Sports with Mackie and Judd today as well. But uh yeah, one oh wild. I think just for fun, I think you should get the flag one more time. Okay, one on one more time. Hold on a second, here we go. There it is. I'm gonna clear out so I don't hit the mic again. There we go. Grit first. 